Some of you guys came from pretty far away. You braved it. You made it. Please drive home safely if you're visiting with us. We're also grateful that you made it in the snowy conditions. Uh, we're just simply Christians. We're trying to follow what we read in Scripture because we're trying to follow Jesus. We believe he is the Son of God, resurrected and reigning, uh, one with the Father and the Spirit. Uh, that's all we're trying to do. If you got any questions about us, what will we believe, um, please talk with us at any time. Stick around. We'd love to get to know you. Uh, shameless uh, plug for the podcast. I just talked about um, reading scripture, being disciplined about that, and going hand in hand when you think about New Year's resolutions. We should also seriously be considering how are our prayer lives. Uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6 and Luke chapter 11. Open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 11, please, to begin if you got it. Luke chapter 11 is where we will begin. I'm going to read verses 1 through 13 of Luke 11, so open up your Bibles there. You can read your Bible all you want. You could just know it in and out, have great doctrine, great theology. And frankly, I really believe it's meaningless if we're not praying to God our Father in heaven. I was asked, I was in the midst of college doing communication and biblical studies and all that stuff, and I was asked at a small devotional by a wise old Christian man, hey, if you could ask Jesus any question, you get one question, what would you ask him? Foolishly, our brains full of a whole bunch of you know, theology mumbo jumbo was like, let's figure out the deal with God's sovereignty and free will and all these kinds of like complicated theological questions. And then it hit us like a minute going into it. We're like, wait, 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 in scripture, that's not what they asked. And we're like, oh, we're dumb. And it, and it showed something about my state at the time and, and where we were so, so full of just knowledge. I believe there's only one time in scripture where explicitly we have someone asking Jesus how to do something. And I think it's really overlooked. Hopefully you're in Luke chapter 11. Let's go ahead and read verses 1 through 13. I'm out of the CSB. He, Jesus, was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Just as John also taught his disciples. He said to them, whenever you pray, say, Father, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we ourselves also forgive everyone in debt to us. And do not bring us into temptation. And he also said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I don't have anything to offer him. And he will answer from inside and say, don't bother me. The door is already locked. My children and I have gone to bed. I can't get up to give you anything. I tell you, even though he won't get up and give him anything because he's his friend, yet because of his friend's shameless boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock. And the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks him for a fish, will give him a snake instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will instead give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Amen not going to say a whole lot on verses 5 all the way up to basically 12, but it's funny. Even someone who's not your friend, he says, is going to wake up and help you out with your needs in the middle of the night if you just keep bugging him pretty much. It's kind of a rabbinic argument of, well, if your father who actually likes you, who loves you, uh, is listening, how much more is he going to give you than that person? And he ends where we will end talking about giving the Holy Spirit. There was, hopefully you caught it, the one question we get asked of Jesus and how to do something, I believe, in Scripture. Now, I'm sure the disciples had tons of questions around Jesus, probably bugging them all the time, day in and day out. I'm sure that was the case. But what we have, I hope we realize in Scripture, I think there's only one time where Jesus is explicitly asked, how do we do this? And they don't say, Lord, teach us to preach. Lord, 
teach us the mysteries of, of God and those things I wanted to know, all this theological mumbo jumbo and God's goodness and the problem of evil may be. Lord, teach us how to raise the dead. They don't ask that. Teach us how to walk on water. Lord, teach us how to calm the storms of the skies and the seas. That's not what's recorded. I think that's stunning. And I've certainly overlooked that in my life a lot. They asked, Lord, teach us to pray. Sometimes we, I, I just overthink prayer because it is a grand mystery. It's just so awesome when you really sit down and kind of think and make your brain hurt and think about prayer. But I think we really overcomplicate it like it's too hard or something. And Jesus is asked, hey, how do we pray? Teach us to pray. And Jesus says, oh, yeah, sure. Uh, here's how you pray. It just tells us pretty plainly. So overlooked, at least for me. I believe with all my heart, it was a fearful thing to watch and listen to Jesus pray. It must have been an awesome thing to listen and to see more spiritually rich and eye-opening than perhaps even his most awe-dropping miracles. Notice in Luke 11, right there at the beginning, it says, He, Jesus, was praying in a certain place, and when he finished then they ask, Lord, teach us to pray. I, I think no one dared to interrupt the Son of God talking to his Father. I believe when the disciples heard Jesus pray, they just could not understand, could not fathom what they were hearing, and it was just too wonderful and beautiful. And you notice, hopefully we notice with our theme this year and going through Mark and the adult class, how many times Luke emphasizes this so much not just before important events, though that's a big pattern. Jesus will wander off. He goes off by himself. People are like, where's Jesus? Everyone's looking for him. And he's out praying. He's been healing all night long. And he goes out early in the morning and goes to pray alone to his Father, full of the Holy Spirit. I hope we notice that pattern. Now, one sermon and my goal here is to just kind of kick us, hopefully, at least just even one person into motivation to take what Scripture says seriously about prayer. I can't change your habits. Uh, it's up to you to respond to God and His Word. But if we're not convinced that our minds need renewed by Scripture, like in Romans 12, 2, or that through prayer we need the Holy Spirit to strengthen us, Ephesians 3, 16, you're just not going to pray. And at that point, you've got to ask, what do you actually believe? And when I'm alone with myself, and it scares me, I hope that we're honest with ourselves, I, we can tell everything about our spiritual life looking at our prayer life with our Father in Heaven. Uh, there's been times in my education of the past where, like I just alluded to in my silly story, read, 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 doctrine, 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 and prayer life was stale. That just can't be the case for us. And so, I, you know, we can't be fooled that our so-called perfect knowledge or, or whatever, that's, en that's not enough for fellowship with our Father who loves us, who's given us his one and only Son. So I'd like to briefly break down what is called the model prayer or the Lord's Prayer. If you want to bookmark Luke 11, we'll come back there. Let's go to the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Matthew chapter 6. So bookmark Luke 11. If you've got your Bible and want to, go to Matthew chapter 6. We're just looking at the prayer itself in verses 9 through 13. In Matthew 6... Um, Jesus has essentially two problems that he's addressing specifically, at least, when it comes to prayer. First of all is the hypocrisy of the religious leaders, not only of prayer, but also their giving. They want to be seen. They want to be heard. They want the praise of the crowd. Jesus is addressing that. But your father sees in secret, as he points out. And he also, Jesus is getting at, there's those who think they can grab the God's or God's attention with just mere vain repetitions. And Jesus says, no, stop that. Your father already knows what you need. After all, he sees you in secret. In Matthew 6, 9, um, I'm out of the CSB. He says, you need to pray then like this. Our Father in heaven. And Luke's account, it's whenever you pray, say, Father. Father. And Matthew there's a communal sense. It's God that is our Father. Prayer, even individually, to some extent, is communal. He's Father of all. 
He's father of everyone in this church, but it's also very individual because it's father. But as Matthew says, it's our father in heaven. So we have something very familiar and then something wonderful, eternal, holy, transcendent when you think of heaven. Totally other. God said, uh, Jesus said about God his father that he is spirit in John 4. He alone is immortal. He alone is the one who lives in unapproachable light whom no one has seen or can see. And yet, Jesus says to address him as father. I think in the Old Testament, God is only called father on a few occasions and it's on analogy to the entirety nation of Israel. Don't think there's an individual out there who calls God his or her own father. They probably would have even considered that blasphemous, perhaps. And you think about Jesus. He's the only one who has the right to address God as father. He's the only one who has that right as God himself, the eternal son of the father, who is with him in glory before the creation of the world, John 17, 5. When we're in sin as sinners, this is a common mistake in our Christianese, Christianized culture. You're not a daughter or son of God in sin. Yes, everyone's made in God's image. Yes, God is the father of spirits in that sense that he puts within us, Hebrews 12, 9. Get that, everyone has dignity as an image bearer. But only are you a child of God is when you are in Christ. You are only a child of God when you are adopted. That's, that's the reality out of like Romans chapter 8. That those who are led by God's spirit are God's sons. Verse 15, Romans 8. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. and said you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. That's what Jesus cried out in the garden of Gethsemane. Very personal. The transcendent one, that, the one that no one has seen, God's, God, the Son, Jesus says, you can call him Father. Father. We are adopted. Now, this is not to be irreverent with that name Father. It's not the same as our fathers here on earth, but it is intimate. It is intimate to call him Father. This is not a filler for a prayer. I've made that mistake for sure. I get that. It's not as if it's doctor, sir, or mister. It's intimate. It is Father. And so Jesus says, you can address God. Not done in the Old Testament. Pretty much unthinkable. Because of Jesus, we can call him Father. Some of us have not had good earthly fathers. Maybe at times some of us have felt like it was... Uh, some sort of impossible standard to live up to your father's uh, acceptance. Uh, some of us have been unloved or felt unloved by our fathers. Not in this heavenly family. We love him because he first loved us. And in the new covenant, he can be called intimately father because his son died in our stead. He says, the rest of Matthew 6, 9, Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. The CSB I think does a good job saying, your name be honored as holy. God's name is wonderful, the I am. It's treated as holy in heaven, so it should be treated here on earth the same as well. Certainly amongst his people, all of verse 10 of Matthew 6, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So practically we can learn from Jesus Our prayer lives are not all about us and me and my desires and wants. Yes, Jesus brings rest. Jesus is the spirit, is a comforter. Scripture tells us to take everything to our Father in heaven. 1 Peter 5, 7. We should cast all our anxieties on him because he cares for you. That makes me think of Shane's sermon last week. God cares about the mundane and the thing and the day-to-day of our lives. And in this model prayer, Jesus says, but it's not only about you. Look beyond ourselves. It's about the kingdom of God and his will. We should be praying for that will of God to be done. It's done in heaven. Are we engaged with it here on earth? Now, verse 8, Matthew 6, tells us God already knows what we need before we ask. He doesn't need added knowledge or wisdom to help us out. It's not like we're going to help him out with his own will being done uh, either necessarily. He doesn't need us. He's not dependent on anything or anyone. 
But it's crazy because the sovereign God asks us to come into relationship with him, in line with his kingdom, and he asks us to participate by praying for him to act. God wants us to be needy and dependent in order to do his will. A quick excursion uh, I think of, uh, I forgot about my slides. You can call God your own father, but his name is to be treated as holy. As I already said, only Jesus can call God his own father. We're loved. He died for us. We are adopted. We are obviously talking about praying for God's will to be done. My excursion that I'm taking us to right now is James 4. God says yes when it's in line to his will, which is hard bluntly for, for me to hear, for us to hear sometimes. James 4, there's all sorts of division going on. He says, what is the source of wars and fights among you? Don't they come from your passions that wage war within you? We all have that in some capacity. Verse 2, you desire and you do not have. You murder, covet, and you cannot obtain. You fight and wage war. And then this, the end of verse 2 is what is just shocking to me. You do not have because you do not ask. And he goes on in, in verse 3. You ask and don't receive. Here's why. Because you ask with wrong motives. So that you may spend it on your own pleasures. Verse 4. You adulterous people. Terrifying language. That we can be so self-involved and use prayer, treat God like this genie or something, and be selfish and sinful and commit idolatry with selfish desires in our prayers. But what's crazy is the end of verse 2. He's talking about asking appropriately, which lines up with what Asher read for us in 1 John 5. If we ask anything according to his will, that's what we want, to pray the will of God. But like I'm saying, the end of verse 2 is nuts. You do not have because you do not ask. Ask. He's saying, ask for it. Prayer causes things to happen that would not have happened unless you've prayed. That's not denying God's sovereignty, but there's that He interacts with us in prayer. Not only is there a relationship with our Creator, it's a loving one, right? We're calling Him Father, despite being sinners, aliens, enemies. But not only this, we get to participate. In the kingdom, the advancement of the kingdom of God. And sometimes we wonder in our personal lives, maybe sometimes as an entire church, I don't know, in our spiritual lives, we're wondering why aren't things, maybe we're not even thinking selfishly, and we're like, man, I haven't had a lot of opportunities to share the gospel, to help those. I'm not growing myself. God says, ask. Just ask. I think that's a lot the reason why we don't have spiritually speaking, because we're not asking. But how do we pray according to his will? We're learning that right now. We're looking at scripture. We're looking to the example of Jesus. Or Matthew 6, 11, back in Matthew 6. Give us today our daily bread. Now some point out very well could be spiritual bread. Maybe pulling on Exodus, the bread from manna. Um, most people go toward it's about physical needs. Um, maybe even both. I'm not 100% sure. But to give us. Notice it's our father in Matthew 6, like I said. Here it's give us. Remember it's communal. You're not alone as a Christian, right? We, uh, we would want to make sure that we pray for not only our own needs, but also for the needs of others. Give us this day our daily bread. Most appropriate. This is not talking about asking for riches. First Timothy 6 says, don't desire to be rich as a matter of fact. That's not, so that should not be our goal. But this is about meeting our needs. I love talking with you guys about prayer because some of you have been through some crazy stuff. And I've just gleaned from it. I, there's so many of you just so encouraging to me where it feels like I'll talk to someone. It's like, well, here's my needs, and I hear them, what their needs are. And I'm like, shoot, I need to be a little bit better about this and, and more humble. But there's nothing wrong in asking for the needs to be met for the advancement of God's kingdom, of course. In verse 12, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Luke 11, 4 says, forgive us our sins. We see sin is debt between these two texts. It is debt before God, eternal, holy, perfectly just and loving. There is debt. We should boldly ask for forgiveness. Boldly. We, we talked about in the Psalms, some of those prayers bug us because they sound so demanding of God. Do it. We can boldly ask for forgiveness because not of anything of yourself, but because of Jesus Christ. 
the righteous, as I have cited up there um, in First John chapter one. He's our righteousness, our advocate, our atonement. Um, in First John one eight through two two, our advocate before God is Jesus. I really like the phrase. Um, I've heard it said in different ways. I don't know who the originator is, but forgiven people forgive others. If we're struggling with bitterness and we're just not forgiving. That's a huge, 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 huge red flag and problem. Ephesians 4 tells us not to be better, not to let the sun go down on your anger and those principles. To forgive because God in Christ has forgiven us. There's a great, I believe he's a really humble man from what I read, great theologian, John Stott. He has a wonderful um, message and commentary on the Sermon on the Mount. And he said, one of the chief evidences of true penitence is a forgiving spirit. Once our eyes have been opened to the enormity of our offense against God, the injuries which others have done to us appear by comparison extremely trifling. If, on the other hand, we have an exaggerated view of the offenses of others, it proves that we have minimized our own. How quick are we to forgive? Forgive 70 times 7. And the last part of this prayer in verse 13 is, do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, or deliver us from evil. God does not directly tempt anyone, James 1.13. Uh, if you were in the adult class, so you saw the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness in order to be tempted. Maybe that's the prayer. Don't put us in that scenario. Maybe it means something like, a lot of people think it means something like, do not uh, let us yield or succumb, succumb to uh, temptation, perhaps. Deliver us from evil. Essentially, I think this is how the, the Bible ends. Revelation twenty two twenty. Lord, come quickly, is the closing prayer amidst persecution and amidst evil and temptation, I think we could say, along with that. Maranatha, Lord, come Lord Jesus. That's, that should be our prayer. Lead us not to temptation. So Jesus has essentially, it's not, obviously it's not, you have to pray literally like this every single time. Um, it's a great thing to memorize. But it's basically an outline. It's We're getting categories of how to pray. And furthermore, because of his sacrifice, his intercession, the things we're gathering around with the table, we can call God, like I'm saying, our Father. He's Father. God is not a judge to condemn us in Christ. He's not a distant God who doesn't care but a loving father who desires all to be saved, 1 Timothy 2, 4, but not only that, who wants to give us good gifts in line with his kingdom, in line with what's actually good for us, not what our flesh thinks is good for us. Okay, hopefully you bookmarked Luke 11. Just go back there with me briefly. Back to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, Matthew's account talks about this as well, about receiving good gifts from your father. Okay, yes, that could include the day-to-day -day needs of giving us our daily bread. Most certainly does. But we're talking about being in line with the will of God on earth as it is in heaven. And you go all the way down to the last verse that I read, verse 13 of Luke chapter 11. If you then who are evil, talking about the fathers who are sinners, who give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? I think we're talking about here, uh, the Holy Spirit helps us pray. Now, I don't know all the details of this verse. I really don't. I read some stuff about it. Some people think in their context it's maybe getting into Acts 1, Acts 2, to Acts 2.38, right? You receive Christ by faith and baptism. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I think that's for sure part of this. But even as someone who is uh, in Christ, we know passages like Romans 5.5, 5, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Could be initial salvation, could do something with our spiritual growth. Either way, maybe it's both. We should pray for more of God, more of Him. This is the greatest gift God can give Himself. That's the message of Adam and Eve, fellowship with Yahweh in the garden and His wonderful creation He made to dwell with them. It was the message of the tabernacle, despite the sin separating that. It's the message of Jesus, Emmanuel, our verse this month, God with us. 
God's greatest gift was sending his own son. And then in the resurrection and ascension of Jesus from the Father, Jesus gives us his own spirit. The greatest gift from God is indeed God himself. And some of us, like I said, we don't know how or or what to pray. Uh, As I'm going to say here in a few minutes, Scripture is a great aid with that. But also realize Jesus is the main intercessor as the resurrected, eternal, spiritual Adam, this new human who can intercede as our high priest for sure. But also we have the Spirit himself, Romans 8 again, this time verses 26 and 7. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Okay, Scripture, very blunt here, and I feel this, because we do not know what to pray for as we should. We don't. Uh, We don't in our flesh. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with inexpressible groanings, is how the CSB puts it. The ESV says, or groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is mine of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. I hope this year, if you're not already, some of you are there. That's great. Like I said, this is motivation. I can't make you change your habits. But I hope this year we see the stunning prayer life of Jesus in Scripture And my own hope and prayer for you is that our prayer lives would increase, as John 16, 25, Jesus says, so that your joy may be full. That is, you enjoy God's will being done. That's my hope and prayer for us this year. So neglected. And so my quick, simple tips from the text that we've looked at are things I'm 99.5% certain that you've probably heard in some way or another. I was going to ask, if you're not there, Are you going to do it? It's an astounding privilege to pray to God in such an intimate way. Hopefully we notice in the text, um, and even Luke 11, set a time and place to pray. It said Jesus was at a certain place. I mentioned this pattern already where he goes off to pray. If you don't set a time and place, at least for me, way less likelihood I'm going to get around to praying. Way, way less likely. Um, often it's not even sin that keeps us from praying. There's been a lot of college football on recently. A lot of stuff like, there's just normal things that are inherently wrong. That stops me from praying. So like I'm saying, Jesus gives us a pattern. You, you need a place. Matthew 6's account talks about going into your inner room. Shut the door. Pray to your Father who sees in secret. And as I've mentioned with scripture reading, if we're struggling, our attention spans with these phones, man, it's rough sometimes. Scripture helps us get on that. Start small. We're not talking about spending hours on end. But start with an actual healthy discipline. And as Jesus teaches us and shows, pray using scripture. I've talked about the value of memorizing and meditating. If you don't know what to say, pray scripture. Uh, The Psalms, as we've talked about in the class, are such a guide And the model prayer we've been looking at gives us the categories of here's the priorities and the subject of which of how we pray. It's right there. Very complex theologically. Very, very simple. God is very simple practically. God is asking us to have faith like a child. Why would we not come to him and pray? Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in a time of need. Let's pray together now. Father, forgive us for not appreciating, valuing, and seeing the worth of prayer. God, we ask that your your spirit would guide us through your word to teach us and mold us and transform us to find joy in you and all that you are for us in Jesus Christ, your son, our advocate, our atonement, our righteousness. We ask, Father, that 
You give us open minds and hearts to your word that convicts us through your power to come to you in prayer. Father, we ask for so many things according to our passions. Forgive us for that. Help us to ask for things according to your will. It is my prayer, Father in heaven, that your name would be honored as holy, that your kingdom would come, that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. We ask, Father, that you give us our daily bread and meet our needs in order to serve you for the advancement of the gospel and for building one another up in love. And forgive us of our many sins and help us to forgive those who sin against us for you've forgiven us in Christ. Help us not to be bitter, to let the sun go down on our wrath. Help us to be merciful as you're merciful to us. Lead us not into temptation, Father, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us for your glory, for your name's sake, that we could enjoy you forever. Give us strength from your spirit to come to you in prayer, to come to you and study your word, to love one another as ourself, to even pray for our enemies who may malign us and hate us, whether they're co-workers, long lost friends or family. Help us to love them as ourself. Give us those opportunities, God, to show them your love in our actions and most certainly in our words too, to proclaim the good news of Christ as King. Forgive us for falling short. Forgive me for falling short. Bless this church, Father, for your kingdom and for your name's sake. It's in your son's most holy name I pray. Amen. If you have any needs from this church, you need prayers, or you need to follow Jesus, come talk to me after, or you can come up now as we stand and sing. Is it for me, dear Savior?